Tonight, unending violence, separatist unrest in Pakistan grows as the conflict renders many dead. Military forces struggling with what looks like a failing fight. Facing the press, US Vice President Kamala Harris defended changing her mind on key issues in her first interview since entering the presidential race. A fragile peace, Israel's military and Palestinian militants group Hamas have agreed to three separate ceasefire agreements to help curb the polio outbreak in the region. Later Gator, a Texas cop takes the handsy way through a sticky situation with an uninvited guest. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Aquil Qureshi. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight on World News. With wrapping up of yet another week, we have lots of updates to bring to you from around the world. And let's begin in a neighbouring region right here. At least 70 people died in a coordinated attack in Balochistan, southwest Pakistan. In an assault claimed by the BLA, the Balochistan Liberation Army raising questions about the deteriorating security situation in the province as it's struggling with a pro-independence insurgency and Islamist armed groups. In the early hours of Monday morning, this police station was besieged by militants of the Balochistan Liberation Army for over five hours. Twelve police officers were taken hostage, their weapons seized before the insurgents set the building on fire. They freed the hostages at dawn before fleeing the area. Across the street, this shopkeeper is one of the witnesses. In less than 24 hours, the Bloat Separatist group attacked 10 districts of the province, blocking highways, burning down vehicles, killing civilians and security forces. 45 kilometers away, the situation is tense in the streets of Quetta, the provincial capital. Day laborers from Punjab are particularly scared. Several people gunned down on roads by insurgents were from their province. Security forces are on high alert in Balochistan as the fear of further attacks grows. Some severe weather updates now. Typhoon Shanshan, which made its landfall in Japan, dumped heavy rains that left at least four people dead and dozens more injured that caused the suspension of flights and bullet train services. Millions of people were ordered to evacuate their homes as the typhoon lashed southwest Japan with a strong winds and torrential rain, knocking out power snarling, air traffic and forcing major factories to close. After hovering over the southerly Kyushu Island for the next few days, the storm is expected to approach Tokyo around the weekend, the country's weather agency said. Strong winds and heavy rain knocked out power and forced major factories to close. Authorities warned Shanshan could be one of the strongest ever storms to hit the region as they assessed the death toll and reported scores left injured. Toyota suspended operations in all of its domestic plants due to the storm, while Nissan, Honda and chipmakers Renesas and Tokyo Electron also temporarily halted production at some factories. The typhoon produced gusts of up to 112 miles per hour, according to the weather agency. Around 230,000 households in seven prefectures were without power in the afternoon, according to Kyushu Electric Power Company. However, the company said there was no impact at its Sendai nuclear power plant in Satsuma Sendai City, where the storm made landfall earlier on Thursday. Airlines announced cancellations of nearly 800 flights. Train services have been suspended in many areas of Kyushu, while hundreds of bus and ferry services have also been halted, according to the transport ministry. Typhoon Shanshan is the latest harsh weather system to hit Japan following Typhoon Ampil, which also led to blackouts and evacuations earlier this month. Flash floods in Sudan have destroyed a highway connecting the flood-hit city of Tokar and at the de facto capital port Sudan, prompting displaced residents to attempt a dramatic rope climb up a destroyed bridge. This is how some residents have been escaping deadly floods in Sudan's Tokar city. 
a dramatic rope climb up one side of what was once a bridge. Toka, in Sudan's Red Sea state, was cut off after flash floods destroyed the main highway to Port Sudan. For those who have lost their homes, that severed their way out. The floods have affected more than 300,000 people nationwide, of whom 118,000 have been displaced, according to UN estimates, earlier this week. That's as this year's rainy season hits more heavily and in some places earlier than in previous years. Homes have been destroyed and diseases like cholera have spread in the war-ravaged country. On Sunday, the Arbat Dam near Port Sudan collapsed, resulting in, according to the UN, the destruction of 20 villages and hamlets and the loss of dozens of lives. Sudan's dams, roads and bridges were already in disrepair before the war between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support forces broke out in April 2023. Since then, both sides have funneled the bulk of their resources into the conflict, leaving infrastructure badly neglected. A Hong Kong court found two editors at now-defunct stand news media outlet guilty of sedition. This is the first sedition conviction against any journalist or editor since Hong Kong's handover from Britain's to China in 1997. The case has received international scrutiny amid a security crackdown in the China-ruled city. The two editors, Chung Pui Kun and Patrick Lam, who wasn't there for the verdict, could face a maximum jail term of two years. Stand News was once a leading online media platform in Hong Kong, featuring a mix of critical reportage and commentary. And critics of this case, including the US government, say the verdict reflects deteriorating media freedoms in the city. Stand News was raided by police in December 2021 and had its assets frozen, leading to its closure a few days later. The editors and the outlet's parent company were all charged with conspiracy to publish seditious publications in connection with 17 news articles and commentaries from July 2020 to December 2021. The articles included commentaries written by exiled activists. The editors pleaded not guilty. During the 57-day trial, the government prosecutor said Stand News had acted as a political platform to promote, quote, illegal ideologies and incited readers' hatred against the Chinese and Hong Kong governments. When testifying in court, Chung said the site had simply sought to reflect a spectrum of voices, including pro-democracy advocates. The judge wrote in a summary that the court had considered, quote, the potential damage to national security in its ruling on seditious intent. The U.S. National Security Advisor wrapped up his trip to China, where he emphasized U.S. commitment to the denuclearization on of the Korean Peninsula. This marks the first visit to China by U.S. National Security Advisor since 2016. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan reaffirmed Washington's commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula during his talks with his Chinese counterparts in Beijing. The remarks were made at a press conference on Thursday as Sullivan wrapped up his three-day visit to China. It also came amid concerns over the lack of reference to denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula from both U.S. Democratic and Republican parties at the recent national conventions. Sullivan also stressed the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and that Washington's One China policy has not changed. High-level talks were held between the two countries to seek stability in their relations. Chinese President Xi Jinping met with Sullivan on Thursday and expressed hope that the U.S. would work with China to get along. Although great changes have taken place in the respective conditions of the two countries and in China-U.S. relations, China's commitment to the stable, sound and sustainable development of China-U.S. relations remains unchanged. Sullivan told Xi that U.S. President Joe Biden was committed to managing Washington-Beijing ties to avoid conflict. The effort comes ahead of the upcoming U.S. presidential election. We are committed to maintaining high-level diplomacy, and to this end, President Biden looks forward to engaging with you again in the coming weeks. The U.S. official hinted that Biden and Xi plan to speak over the phone in the coming weeks and possibly meet in person at APEC and the G20 summits slated for November. 
Sullivan arrived in Beijing on Tuesday on a three-day visit, marking the first trip by a U.S. national security advisor in eight years. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now. Along the campaign trial, both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have pledged to use government funding to make housing and goods more affordable. But they very have different ideas on how to do that. As a latecomer to the race, Harris has been rolling out her economic agenda focused on lifting up the middle class. We know a strong middle class has always been critical to America's success. And building that middle class will be a defining goal of my presidency. Harris is pledging to give money directly to U.S. consumers by permanently expanding the child tax credit, including a $6,000 break for parents with infants, and to give first-time home buyers a leg up by providing a government contribution of $25,000 toward a down payment. Harris also has promised a federal ban on price gouging on everyday items, including groceries. She's proposed paying for all this by raising taxes on the rich, or those making more than $400,000 a year. For his part, Trump has promised to extend his namesake tax cuts, which are due to expire at the end of next year, and to add new tax cuts for corporations and to eliminate taxes on tips. If you're a restaurant worker, a bartender, a hospitality worker, a caddy, a barber, a mover, driver of any kind. We are going to let you keep 100 percent of your tip. Many of the tariffs Trump imposed on China during his first term are still in effect. But if re-elected, he's promised an across-the-board 20 percent tariff on all imports, costs that economists say would be passed on to consumers. We will end America's housing shortage by building three million new homes and rentals. While Kamala Harris has pledged to build more housing, Trump says he would free up housing space by deporting millions of immigrants illegally residing in the U.S. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris defended changing her mind on key issues in their first interview since entering the presidential race. The Democratic nominee was pressed on why her policies on immigration and climate have changed since she ran for president in 2019. Harris was under pressure to finally face questions, but she shared the 27-minute pre-recorded interview with her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. A Republican opponent, Donald Trump, used a single word in his review after it concluded. Boring, the former president wrote on a truth social. The vice president was forced to defend the White House's economic track record as inflation and high cost of living prices continue to hurt Americans. Polls have regularly suggested that voters would prefer Mr. Trump's handling of the economy, but the most tense exchange centered on the evolution of her policy positions. Harris also was asked about the war in Gaza and reiterated that the White House position that both Israel and Hamas must get on a deal done and that Palestine deserves to have their own country neighboring Israel. On a related note, a WHO official said Israel's military and Palestinian militant group, Hamas, have agreed to three separate zones, three-day pauses in fighting in Gaza to allow for the first round of vaccinations of 640,000 children against polio. A two-round polio vaccination campaign is, uh, will actually start on the 1st of September. The WHO official overseeing the Palestinian territories said the campaign is due to start Sunday. Each pause in fighting will last three days, with hostilities halted between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. local time each day. And we start in central Gaza for three days, followed by south Gaza, and then followed by the north of Gaza. The campaign comes after the WHO last week confirmed at least one baby has been paralyzed by the type 2 polio virus. It's the first such case in the territory in 25 years. The child, Abdul Rahman, is just days away from his first birthday. He should be learning to walk. His mother, 
Naveen Abu Jidyan says he was born just weeks before the war began, and because they had been displaced from one place to another, he did not have all his routine infant vaccinations. Almost two months ago, she noticed something was wrong when her son couldn't crawl as usual. Suddenly, I found a boy vomiting. He stopped moving and had a fever. He also stopped walking and crawling. I took him to the Al-Aqsa Maltai as a hospital, and I was told my son might have polio. He took antibiotics for 15 days, and they took some samples from him to Jordan. I got a call from the health ministry saying Abdul Rahman is the only child and the only detected case of polio until now. It was a shock for me. Naveen says she's in shock, especially as she says she's been told by doctors there's little more they can do for her son. He is my only baby boy. It's his right to travel and be treated. It's his right to walk, run and move like before. It's his right to get the proper treatment, travel, get out and get his chance at life. It is unfair that he stays in this tent without care or attention. Poliomyelitis is a highly infectious virus primarily spread through the fecal-oral route. It can invade the nervous system and cause paralysis. Cases of polio have declined by 99% worldwide since 1988, thanks to mass vaccination campaigns and efforts to continue to eradicate it completely. The UN says it is now preparing to vaccinate an estimated 640,000 children in Gaza. The latest bloodshed in the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict was triggered on October 7th when the Palestinian Islamist group Hamas attacked Israel, killing 1,200 and taking about 250 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. Israel's subsequent assault on the Hamas-governed enclave has since killed over 40,000 Palestinians, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. A salvage operations begun on an abandoned Greek-flagged oil tanker with deck fires still burning from the Houthi rebel attacks. The EU's Red Sea naval mission, Aspide, said no oil spills has been detected. A crude oil tanker recently attacked by Yemen's Houthis is leaking oil, but the barrels of crude oil on board remain intact. That's according to Pentagon spokesperson Sabrina Singh on Thursday. The Houthis also released a video Thursday said to show storming and burning of the Greek flag tanker Sunion in the Red Sea. The vessel has been on fire since August 23rd. On Wednesday, the Iran-aligned militants said they would allow salvage crews to tow the ship to safety, a move that may help avoid what experts warned could be a devastating spill of 150,000 tons of crude oil. As salvage operations began on Sunion, the EU's Red Sea naval mission Aspides said on Thursday that no oil spill has been detected. Afghan women activists inside and outside the country have published videos of themselves on social media singing revolutionary songs against the strict morality laws that were formally confided by the Taliban last week. Referring to a supposed time in the future when the laws are lifted, one anonymous woman sings. Will you seal the silence of my mouth until the second order? You made me a prisoner in my home for the crime of being a woman. The 35-article morality law ranges from requiring women to cover their entire bodies and faces and men to grow beards, to banning drivers from playing music or transporting women without a male guardian, a spokesman from the Justice Ministry said. The rules were based on a 2022 decree by the Taliban's supreme spiritual leader, Haibatullah Akunzada. The Taliban suspended Afghanistan's previous constitution when they took over in 2021 as foreign forces withdrew and said they would rule the country according to Islamic Sharia law. Their restrictions on women and freedom of expression have drawn sharp criticism from human rights groups and many foreign governments since. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More World News right after this. Welcome back. It's never an easy situation when an unwanted guest shows up in front of your door, especially not if they are snappy kind. Well, over in Texas, one handy policeman knew just how to handle the situation, wrangling the situation expertly. Wrestling a gator is probably not what this Texas police officer had on his to-do list. 
The Fullshire Police Department says they were called out to a suburban home for a possible intruder. The culprit was spotted on the front porch. Oh, right there. The officer had the equipment to capture the juvenile alligator safely, but he decided to go with his bare hands. Even though the gator was small, his teeth were still sharp, and he clearly didn't want to leave his spot in the shade. Alligators are a protected game animal in the state of Texas. They are no longer endangered, but special permits are required to hunt, raise, or possess alligators. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin wrapping up this week. We'll see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Anuradha Wickremesinghe will join you on Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.